<laughs> All right, good evening. It is just a little bit after 7 o'clock p.m. on Monday, the 7th of December. This is a regular meeting of the Richfield Board of Education. Uh, in attendance this evening are Tim Paulus, Deb Etchen, John Ashmead, Christine Malik, Todd Nolenberger, Superintendent Yunowski, our student representatives, Catherine Zolmer and David Munoz, and I am Peter Tensing. And it is a pleasure to welcome everybody here this evening. Um, first off, as I am trying to make a new habit, I do want to remind everyone to take a look at the header of our agenda. Uh, so again, centering ourselves on the on the mission of our uh, of this board and the mission of our district to inspire, empower, and empower each individual to learn, grow, and excel. Um, so again, just that moment of of recognition of what we're all about. Um, I will look to the board for review and approval of the agenda. So moved. I'll second it. So motion by Nolenberger and second by Ashmead that we approve the agenda as presented. Any discussion on that item? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Chair votes aye and the agenda is approved. We will go ahead and move on to uh, reports and information from school sources. So the first item is the superintendent update. And just a very brief couple of reminders for us. Um, as we are on December 7th, just a reminder that we go December 21st and 22nd. And so the final day of school prior to winter break is December 22nd. So that two day week um, where we are going to be teaching all the way up through the 22nd. Uh, we also have a board orientation for our new board members on the 21st. So new board member Paula Cole, new board member Crystal Bracke will be taking tours of the school, getting an orientation to the district and spending some time with us through an extended day of an orientation to get accommodated to their new roles, of which they'll be sworn in at that first meeting in January. So on that same note, it's the second to last meeting for Director Nolenberger and Director Etchen. So we will miss them and we'll definitely create an event to signify that transition. So we were warning them in advance. <laughs> Whatever that might mean. <laughs> we were them in advance with a gray foreshadowing of, right. of a celebration of their dedication yes. to Richfield Public Schools, for which we are very appreciative. So prepare, prepare your roasting comments now. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Thank heavens Deb has given us so much material. <laughs> Probably. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chief Holgi, who is here to talk about one of my favorite topics in the entire <laughs> civilized world, truth in taxation. Good evening. Uh, yeah, this is an official meeting. Um, it is a requirement under state statute that we share information, but it's also just good practice for school districts to share information with their taxpayers in the community about how the school district uses funds, and then also propose levies, and then provides an opportunity for community members to comment on that during the open meeting. Um, it is tied in specifically with the state statute. There was a notice that was mailed to all taxpayers within the city of Richfield um, for all property owners um, that includes the levy amount and the impact, and that's information that was based on the projected um, or the preliminary referendum and preliminary levy um, earlier this year. It also provides notice of this public meeting um, and the opportunity to come and give feedback and seek your information. And then the final certification for the levy is due by the end of December for the 2015 payable levy. Um, tonight we're really going to talk about five items. One is what is the levy certification process? What does that look like? Um, two, provide some basic information about school funding. Three, to look at the 2015-16 budget, which was approved by the board back in June, um, to talk about the proposed 2016 levy, and then also to provide an opportunity for public questions and comments. So when we look at the levy certification process specifically in July and August of each year, um, district administration um, shares information with the Department of Ed about our enrollment, our projections, um, as well as the intent of the board um, to calculate some information um, based on the levy. Uh, in September, there's a preliminary levy certification that's done by the Board of Education. Generally, all boards approve the maximum levy at that point, so that it gives us the latitude during the course of the fall to make adjustments in that uh, calculation. Um, the county mails propose tax statements which share information based on that levy authority um, in that preliminary levy. Uh, we have the truth in taxation hearing, and then again at the December 21st meeting this year, we'll be asking the school board for a final certification of that levy. 
Um, when we look at the last four years, we really see an, in, an increase, a decrease, and now another increase. And we'll talk a little bit more about why some of those adjustments are made. Um, 2013, we were at 17,600,000. Uh, in 2014, 18 million 300. Uh, for the current year, it's 18 million 50,000. We see an increase um, up to 19 million 298 for the payable 2016 levy. One of the unique things about um, school districts is we have to look at our funding needs and our enrollment um, quite a ways out. Um, the legislation, uh, the state legislator, legislatures generally take a look at what is their funding during the course of the year. They take that revenue in during 2015 and it's expended during 2015. Uh, cities, counties, townships make their tax levy decisions generally in the fall of every year like we take a look at it. Um, but then they collect their levy and it's based on a levy that's the calendar year of the year that the taxes are coming in. And for school districts, we make our levy decisions here during the fall. Um, we collect the revenue or the state collects the revenue and the county collects the revenue for us during the course of the calendar year and then we receive that from July through June. Uh, that fiscal year for school districts really ties with the school calendar um, as far as first day of school and end of school and so it's tied more in that way. Uh, when we look at the levy specifically, we're looking at there are four levy fund types for school districts that are um, revenue is generated by the levy. One is the general fund. Uh, the second is a community service fund or community education programming. Third is the debt service fund. Uh, and the fourth is the other post employments benefit debt service fund. Uh, the general fund levy has a number of categories that are tied in with it um, from alternative teacher compensation, achievement and integration capital, health benefits reemployment, um, building leases, health and safety, and a variety of dollars that are tied in with each one of those programs that are specific to the levy. The community service fund is community service, early childhood education home visits and adults with disabilities are all levies specifically targeted within those areas. The debt service fund is outstanding debt that the district has incurred. Um, really in Richfield we see two specific programs that are part of this alternative facilities which are larger scale capital projects um, as well as the OPEB debt. Many districts and in the past Richfield has also had a general obligation debt which was a voter approved referendum bonding um, for large scale um, capital projects. That actually expired for this current payable year. Um, so that was, I call it the 90s project, um, because that's when it was implemented and that was a 20 year project that now is off uh, the tax <coughs> rolls. Um, and that's also based on the actual debt retirement schedules. Um, obviously, um, much of this funding is tied specifically with enrollment and we see that there are fluctuations every year in enrollment and the calculations that are used for those levy totals and one of the things that we'll talk about is we see those adjustments based on what we're, or we levy for what we're projecting, but then we see adjustments made on that every year for what the actual enrollment is in any given year. And so that's one of the things where there are constantly fluctuations in that levy based on that information. So when we look at the adopted budget that was approved by the board in June, uh, that really articulates a few different areas. One, you can see that um, the revenue for the general fund um, that was approved by the board was 58,899,000. That was projected as part of the budget. There was a projected 58,988,000 dollars in expenditures that were projected, which had a slight decrease in our projected fund balance, um, but had a projected fund balance of 2.6 million. Uh, you can see some other smaller numbers in the food service and the community education fund. The debt service fund, uh, you see some reductions in there. The internal service fund, which is tied specifically with the self-funded insurance program, the OPEB trust, and then that OPEB debt service uh, levy. So the total district budget for 2015-16 um, had $74,338,173 mil $74, in revenue, uh, $74,464,870 in expenditures, which are projected fund balance in all of those areas of $17,230,071. Now, uh, if you notice that there are some specific funds that are in each one of these areas, so that's not $17 million that we have at our access and disposal in any given year, because much of that is going to fund long-term projects. Uh, when we look at the local school levy portion, which is specifically what we're talking about here in the next <coughs> stage, um, one is the voter approved, so there are bond votes, like that 90s project, um, which are opportunities to increase or change your facilities in large-scale projects. Um, the other are operating levy votes, um, which specifically are for us our voter approved referendum as well as our technology referendum, 
are both in, within that voter approved components of that. Um, also, the school board has decisions and authority to levy certain amounts for certain categories beyond those voter approved areas. Um, those are specific special levy authorities like health and safety dollars that can only be used for certain areas and that levy authority is limited to the school board by the, uh, through legislation. So again, looking at the levy um, for payable 2015, which is the year that we're currently in, versus what's proposed, um, will be proposed at the December 21 meeting, um, looking at that increase from 18,050,000 to 19,298,552. And um, then you can see graphically how that's distributed across the general fund, the community service, the general debt service fund, and that OPEB debt component. And if you break that down into percentages, about 70% is straight general fund, two and a quarter percent is the community service, and then about 26, 27% is going to pay off those debt service areas. Um, those are projects that have been approved by the board in the past um, and or approved by the state for that authority. So looking at the general fund levy, uh, specifically, you can see that there are some variations here. The net increase for the levy total for 2016-17 is $810,000. Um, you can see some adjustments that are being made in this. So if you look at this uh, graph or this um, document, you can see that there's $311,000 being reduced for uh, deferred maintenance, another $514,000 being reduced from health and safety, but you also see an increase of $950,000 in long-term facilities. That specifically is a change in how the state is funding those programs and recalculating it. So they've eliminated uh, three different areas, two of which Richfield was using, and added it to a $950,000 line item for the long-term facilities. There still are some specific things that we are required to use for that, um, like health and safety, but it provides a little bit more latitude for the district in some of those areas as far as what we're able to use. Um, with that recalculation, one of the things that we also have seen is that there's an increase of about $125,000 in all areas within that to Richfield schools. Um, I believe that one of the areas that Richfield benefited from is part of that calculation ties to age of buildings. And so because Richfield has an older facility, I believe that's part of that calculation that has that net impact for the district. Um, other areas to take a look at here, uh, you can see that there's a $243,000 increase in the referendum. Um, one of the things that, as I articulated earlier, is our levies are based on projections. When we have increases to our enrollment or our adjusted pupil units from what was projected, those adjustments are made down the road. And so this is a year that we're seeing about $125,000 adjustments being made based on some changes in enrollment from a couple years ago. The other thing that the state did a few years ago is look at the calculation for how they fund referendums and adjusted that um, based on the pupil weighting. And so that's kind of a moving component where they've held districts harmless. So there isn't a reduction in it based on a calculation of pupil units, but um, they continue to refine what that model looks like. And so that's about another $125,000 of adjustments in that piece. Again, those are things that are tied just automatically from how the state is calculating it, and it is making us whole. Just like a year like now, where our attendance or enrollment ended up less than what we're projected, we should anticipate that a couple years from now, we'll see a decrease in our levy authority because of the, to make that adjustment take place. Um, the other area that you see a larger increase is the referendum for technology. That specifically is tied to an increase in our net tax capacity across the district from about $35 million to about $40 million, um, which we believe is um, specifically tied primarily with some commercial property that was in a tax increment financing district that was excluded from tax in this area that now is coming onto the tax rolls that has a benefit in that area. Um, where the general referendum, like the voters just approved this year, is based on pupil units, the technology referendum is based on the net tax capacity of the district and what the tax valuation is of each one of the properties. So there are two different ways that those are calculated. And so that's, the benefit, that's um, why that is increasing. That won't necessarily increase the average homeowner in the district unless they've seen their property values go up. And then um, I think those were the primary areas that we were looking at on this. Any questions? Greg, I'm sorry. Yeah. You mentioned earlier um, 
uh, the, the idea that that you know pre at a pre prior meeting we authorized the, to levy to, to the maximum authority. Are there examples within this this chart where we aren't exercising that? And you know what what goes into the decision to you know what 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 is the decision process that gets us to decide to you know for a particular category to levy at the maximum amount or to, or to peel it back? Yeah. So when we get to the debt excess, that's when that we've seen the greatest under levy opportunities here. Um, generally, the adjustments are made based on um, what is in the revenue, what's in the budgets in each one of those areas, and then kind of how that factors with the enrollment. So we haven't intentionally reduced that specifically in this area. Um, there's a potential to take a look at doing that in the debt service component of it, but not in this area. In the community education program, you can see it's relatively close, about $9,999 more um, is what's being proposed for next year compared to the current year. Um, and then when we get to the debt service piece. So a couple areas here to take a look at. The debt levy, that is that um, general obligation debt. That was the 90s project. I'm going to keep calling it tonight just because that, from my perspective, there's some relevance to that. So we can see that that came off and then um, that averages out to that zero. The debt excess, um, one of the things that we're, able, we're required to do um, by the state is to levy 5% more than what our uh, debt is for principles and interest. And the reason that is required is they don't want school districts to go into default. So we're able to levy additional revenue to make sure that we don't go into, a, into default. When our reserve in that area gets too large, the state will step in and say, okay, you need to reduce your debt levy. And so that's where we see a year like last year where the board specifically reduced that debt excess by $600,000. So when we see that reduction, that was a significant component of that area. Um, Long-term facilities debt service you see is increasing $4 million. But if you go to the line before that, or below that, you see there was $4.2 million the previous year. And again, that is just a switch in what those um, line items are called and how those programs are established. Um, but it's $4.2 million for uh, payable 15 and then $4.2 million for payable 16. The OPEP bond, you can see a slight reduction of $117,000 in that area with that debt excess where there's an under levy in that area and that's based on the actual accrual and actual need specifically tied with that. And then the abatement adjustment on both this and the general really is tied in with situations where taxpayers are requesting that the values of their property be adjusted. Um, generally, the taxpayers are asking that they go lower. Um, so there's um, some calculations that are in place into that state funding for that purpose. Great. Can, yeah. I, can I ask uh, the OPEB bond? What, what is the, what is the, how long are we going to have the OPEB bond? Do you know when that, um, expires. Oh, when that expires? Thanks. I'm looking to Bernice because I think she has yeah. what the length of this is. It's a yeah. 15, it was a 15 year bond, Todd? Am I recalling that correctly? It's 15 or 20, I can't remember for yeah. sure which. And I believe we passed it in 08 or 09. That's fine. Okay. okay. So we'll, we'll find that information. That's great. Thank you. So, and then obviously that's based on actual calculations as far as what that bonding was. So when we look at kind of the summary of these areas um, and what those adjustments are, um, we see that there's about 6.92% increase or $1.2 million increase. Um, the major changes that we just talked about on that levy document was a $950,000 long-term facilities, much of which was offset by that health and safety in the deferred maintenance areas. Um, we see that increase in the technology referendum, which is because there are additional, uh, that net, tech, net tax capacity coming into the district. Uh, we talked about those adjustments to the referendum of $243,000. And then an increase of, and I say an increase of $600,000, but there isn't the additional tax of that $600,000, but it's offset by the reduction of $600,000 that the board made from the tax rolls last year. And then this is just kind of a summary of the overall funding pieces. And again, this isn't the impact on the average homeowner, um, but the general approved uh, is 10.27% increase in the voter approved general, a um, 5.09% increase in the other local levy for that average of 6.92. And then when we look at the impact on the market values of residential property in the district, 
we see that, that um, for a $200,000 home, which is slightly more than what um, is the average home in the district, is about a $50 um, projected increase in that tax impact. But again, much of that is recalculations of the state funding formulas. As well as, and I should articulate that second piece, which is about half of that, is that $600,000 that the board specifically under levied last year. So with that, um, I'm open for any public comments and or questions regarding this portion of the agenda. So Craig, can you take it back one slide? There was a question I have based on the conversation we had earlier. As I look at the tax impact on a $200,000 house um, at 838 after election, uh, my understanding is, is that in 1314, taxes were actually still significantly higher than that. Is that correct? Yep. So in 13-14, it was about uh, 1,034 on that average $200,000 home. Um, it went down to 819,000, I believe it was. You know, so we, every year we see adjustments of 30, 40, 50 dollars up or down, sometimes greater than that, based on those factors that we talked about. Um, the years that we do a significant under levy for that debt excess, we see some reductions. Um, years that enrollment is being adjusted for, we see changes, you know, up or down in those areas as well. Greg, yes. I have a question back on um, the slide, the general fund slide. Um, the locational, location optional levy. Is is that um, the is that the portion of um, levy that that was shifted used to be strictly? Is it, if, am I remembering this right? Is that yep. the, the amount of levy that was strictly voter controlled and then was put within board control? Yeah. Okay. Um, and that that's increasing, but it seems to be increasing by a different percent than than the up than. So is that tied to um, enrollment? Is that tied to average daily membership or? Or is that in tied to the, our taxing authority? Because it just seems like it's, it's going up by a different amount than um, the location optional levy on the general fund slide. The 35,022? Right. Okay. Local optional revenue is actually the four hundred and twenty four dollars times which is the actual local optional allowance times the adjusted people unit number of four thousand seven hundred and forty one. So it, it so that remains fixed at four twenty four. Correct. So the only ebb and flow there is, is based on the, the, the true up and the, the estimates. Yes. Okay, thanks. Please. <laughs> and, and just, I'm sorry for my clarification. Um, the 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 enrollment figure that is used for calculating the 47, the weighted, uh, that weighted ADM, that comes from our enrollment uh, as of which fiscal year? It, it's based on the projections. Projections prior to October 1st. So got it. A district has to submit projections and maintains projections over a number of years. So these were projections that were in place. Um, Prior to October one, right. Um, so th these are these are from our things that were calculated last year. Yeah, these were our enrollment projections from last year, but yeah. it's not reflecting necessarily our change in enrollment. Current enrollment, yeah, right. Because I think that, that that's a, a good point. Because I think we've been, you know, from from a public perspective, we've been talking about our decline in enrollment, but recognizing that that projection does not necessarily reflect that decline. But we would expect that there would be an adjustment down the road. Absolutely. To, Which we need to plan. Yeah, to sort of shift that back to the property taxpayer, yeah. Mm -hmm. My understanding is, so this trails by a year, and so a reduction in enrollment means and foreshadowing that there would be a property tax reduction a year from now with a reduced number of student calculation? Um, I have to confirm the exact year it's calculated on. I think these adjustments are being calculated off of 13-14 because that's the actuals that the state has in place. But we need to confirm that question of the exact year that those are based on. And then an additional thing to address, and this isn't more a question, more of a statement, but if we note the referendum technology work and we reiterate that we had a technology strategic plan and our board worked very hard to get effective financing to do 
um, basically a five-year project in three years, or in, well, actually in one summer, and then try to pay that off over, over several years. The point of, of the increase in our referendum for technology is to begin accelerating that timeline for paying that off um, and begin in a faster time frame getting technology into the hands of our students. So just reminding that we did that large, large summer project to upgrade our fiber, our network, our wires. We'd initially anticipated around $4 million. It came in under budget. Um, and so we are working to obviously pay that off while also accelerating our technology to increase learning for our students. Any other items? Other questions for Mr. Holgi or Ms. Humnick? So as a reminder to the public that this is, you know, our, our first uh, presentation of this, of this information and we will be uh, voting on our final certification at the December 21st meeting. Um, so even though we have, don't have any public comment to receive in person today, um, that comment could be received through other means uh, in the interim. Thank you. Yeah. So we can go ahead and move on to the next item, communications from non-school sources. There are a few commendations to report, Mr. Yanowski. Yes, um, our high school band program performed an original, original piece from Aaron Perrine. And Aaron gave thanks and gratitude to our students and our ability to work with the Richfield Band during his commission work and his residency. So I also want to give a shout out to our high school students and our high school band director, Ben Hain, for their excellent work um, with that original piece played, played by our band. Um, and then similarly, I want to talk a little bit about Brandon Clay. So as some of you may have read, um, we weren't able to field the hockey team this year. Um, we've had significant reductions over the years in the number of students who have been suiting up for hockey. Um, and yet, our hockey team had committed to bagging groceries as part of their way of giving thanks. And Tina Lavin, who was the head of our CQC, wanted to give a shout out to acknowledge the great teamwork and commitment that Brandon Clay, one of our students, showed um, towards both the hockey team, but also Richfield Athletics and our community. Um, Brandon is one of those students that clearly embodies true Spartan spirit, because even though the hockey team didn't end up continuing on their season, he did show up to bag groceries the day before Thanksgiving, fulfilling the team obligation and commitment. And so really showing that for him, it was about making a statement to our community rather than anything else. So we want to publicly commend and thank Brandon Clay for publicly showing his Spartan spirit, Spartan pride. I would want to add, actually, there were other members of the team who were there that day. Um, you know, I don't, I don't want to miss anyone, so I won't name them all. Although Nick Omer rolled my stuff out to the car, so thanks, Nick. Thanks <laughs> to the many other hockey players who were there. Um, obviously, commendations are based on who shares that information, and so there were, definitely prob there were definitely additional hockey players, perhaps even other athletes. And so thank you for representing Richfield very effectively. So yeah, thank you very much for uh, those commendations. Uh, we can take a look at the consent agenda. Uh, if there are any questions, uh, we can entertain those questions now. Otherwise, we could look for a motion. We approve the consent agenda. I'll second. So motion by Etchen, second by Malik that we approve the consent agenda. Is there any discussion on this item? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Chair votes aye. The consent agenda passes. We do not have old business to work this evening, so we will move on to uh, item six, the first item under uh, new business, which is the management team handbook. All right, so I am bringing forth today the management team handbook. Uh, management team includes um, our chief assistant superintendent and executive director position, our director positions, and also our principal and assistant principal positions. So these are the school district administration. Um, as part of the process, um, in terms of recommending these two handbooks, because after this we'll be recommending the classified management handbook, um, we went through several pieces of a process. Um, we evaluated our teacher settlement um, with our collective bargaining unit, the teachers, and then we also did a salary study to try to collect information from surrounding districts. 
Cellular studies are quite unique and very difficult to fully gather. They're basically um, reliant on other districts to be willing to openly share all of their information. Um, because, well, districts definitely, and we, we do this also, post all of their information on the internet. Um, some of these specifics like, what is the actual cost of health benefits in a specific district? Or what are the costs of dental benefits in a specific district? Those are things that are more maintained within their HR department as opposed to being able to call online. So we worked our way through that to try to get a, get a vision for where our administration is compared to our colleague districts. And that information was taken into account along with other settlements that we've had to come forward with this settlement. It's recommended that we increase base salary of 2.5%. As we think about how that compares um, to a teacher settlement, teachers ended up with a base salary of 2% increase, but what teachers have in their contract um, is called steps and lanes. And steps and lanes are based on education and based on seniority. So a 2% settlement for a teacher contract actually ends up landing around a 3.8% increase in their salary, or at least in for this past year. Um, with regard to our management team, academics and continuing study aren't actually figured in, so they actually are not lanes within, within the traditional administrative study. Um, and then additionally, um, steps, there are a very small number of steps. So while the teacher contract has well over 20 steps on their contract, the administrative contract has five. Um, so recommending the 2.5 actually ends up landing at a full total package of approximately 2.8% increase for our administrators, which actually lands as a salary increase of 1% less than we, are, we agreed to for our teachers in August. For me as a superintendent, that was an important part of this factor because as we compared how our teachers had landed in comparison to our colleague districts, um, we wanted to begin to close that comparison in regard to where our administrators land overall. Um, additional, in regard to our overall management, obviously over the last year we've had some significant changes in our organizational structure. Um, Mr. Holgi uh, moved from his previous position and it is now over all operational areas um, into that chief position. Um, we also um, added a, or are changing our supervisor of finance in titles to director of finance and also moving with our supervisor of human resources and switching that title to director of human resources. Uh, finally, with, with that significant um, add of responsibilities, looking at that market comparison, um, chief operational officer would have a market salary adjustment um, and then within the priorities of management team. So one of the pieces that we did in regard to these conversations was have a feedback session with our management team. We also held a similar feedback session with our classified management team to talk about what are the top priorities and what are the top priorities of the groups. Um, as we worked through many of the priorities, what we discovered is, is that many of the management team priorities are actually already administrative rights. One of the things they wanted to talk about was continuing education and putting funding towards continuing education. And yet, at present, as a school board, as a superintendent, we have the ability to pay for continuing education if it aligns to our overall, our overall vision and needs as a district. Uh, similarly, one of the conversations was, A, to equalize vacation days, and we began in that direction, um, to move the lowest level numbers from 20 to 25 vacation days on the team. Um, but they also wanted to talk about a payout for unused vacation days. Um, and similarly, as far as a management team right goes, we already have the ability, if we assign our leadership to additional days, we have the right to make that decision administratively if we want to. Um, and so those are things that weren't suggested or aren't being brought forth to suggest putting into the contract. Um, and then finally, if you look at year two, um, similar base salary schedule adjustment, 2.5%, again, landing at 1% less total package than teacher salary increase. Um, and then the addition of President's Day as a paid holiday. So if you recall in our teacher bargaining contract, um, we went from Martin Luther King or President's Day as holidays to and. Um, and so we wanted to provide that opportunity here um, to our administrative team. So at that point, I will pause and open it up for questions. Are there questions from Mr. Yunowski or Mr. Miltier around uh, the management team handbook? I, I have a few questions. Um, we had talked before the meeting, uh, Steve, about the how hard it is to, to pull additional information um, from other districts. Is could could you talk about how hard that is, and you know, and, and how it? I mean, 
So one of the, there are a few things that contribute to that. One, one is that, that we're suggesting that there are a few positions that need market salary adjustments. Um, but we, we, re, we've heard a lot in the last year and a half that our, we're very competitive as, a, as, an employee, as an employer within the market. And so I'm just curious how that, you know, is that, is that a, a specific strategy of ours that we, you know, consciously decided to, to have that as a, as a strategy to, to, to be somewhere, a, a district that's higher than typical? And do we have the data to support that? Um, and then you also mentioned um, the health, you know, so within that, in, in pulling salary data from other districts, that it's really difficult to, to value out the, the other benefits that might come with it, like health and wealth, or most usually we just talk about health benefits. Um, but I know that in other negotiations, and you mentioned the teachers, we, we, we have valued, we found that our, we, we feel our plan is, is perhaps generous and adds to the total package, package disproportionately. So while our salaries for teachers are competitive within the market, they might be slightly lower as a salary number, but when you factor in the value of the health benefit, it, it, ca it more than catches up. Is that possibly also the case for the management team? And is that something, if, if we're being competitive in salary and overly competitive in, in say, healthcare, you know, that's something we, we would want to be aware of, I think, if, if, if that's something we want to do consciously or manage that. All right, so, as we, so what I try to do is begin with our mission and take things to our strategic plan. And if we think about our number four strategy in regard to our strategic plan, it's in regard to using our fiscal and human capital resources to achieve our goals. Um, and so if we think about what is the specific statement, it's difficult to make a statement on exactly where we should land from a competitive salary and benefit package perspective. What I think we want to land at is something that allows us to attract staff. Um, we don't want to lose staff, obviously. Um, we want to be competitive within the marketplace, but we also don't want to be out of, out of a range where we are significantly overpaying and off of the top. Um, let me turn it over to Mr. Miltier to talk briefly about his salary, how he went about gathering the information because, well, I gave the guidance and expectations to Mr. Miltier because he actually is part of the management team contract. Um, he actually did all of the legwork to begin to gather that data and gather total package information. So Joel, could you talk to us about the process you went through and some of the data you gathered? Absolutely. We sent a survey out to all districts that are part of the Minnesota Association of School Personnel Administrators to start with and, got a, and looked to get a response from them. There are over 400 school districts statewide and we had approximately 27 of 26 of those school districts responded to the survey, which is actually a very large number when we look at past surveys and the school districts that have responded. So we're very pleased with that. Not all of those school districts were immediately around us. We looked at about probably seven or eight school districts in our immediate area as well as a lot of outstate school districts as well. So it gave us a good comparison both locally and across the state as well. And we looked at not just our salary ranges, our top salary ranges for our positions. We also did look at those medical and dental benefits as well as some of the other key items that we have in our benefits package to compare across the board. And so once we compiled all that data, we compared both total comp for our administrators, which is adding everything up together, as well as just looking straight at the total top salaries as well. And what we found is just as you pointed out, is that our salaries were probably a little bit on the lower end of the spectrum with those other 25 school districts. But once we added in our benefits, since we have such a strong benefits package, it did bring us more up to the middle of the pack, maybe even a little bit higher than the middle of the pack for total comp for our administrators. A couple of the specifics within that to just add some detail to that. So our, our principals ended up somewhere around the 70th percentile. Um, our directors, and this is where it was very hard to figure out directors. Most districts don't have a director of math. Um, most might have a director of literacy or teaching and learning, and that would be often paid at a higher level than ours. So there were, there were a range of positions that didn't necessarily have comparables. So that made it a little bit challenging to, if we were to try to do specific director-based salary based on title, it made it very challenging to go down that direction, sort of hence hence coming to a recommendation of that across the board work. Um, similarly, in terms of the market rate adjustment, um, with a chief operational officer, somebody taking HR, finance, and all of the operation areas, that tended to be across, the, across all districts, the second highest paid person within the district, and significantly high salaries, some of them even higher than a superintendent's salary might be in many other districts. 
Is it, is it possible to, to see the, the survey results and, and see, I mean, you said 26, but it was out of 400 and relatively few are, are you know, it's, it's hard to find out who our peer group is sure. or, or to compare ourselves to peers. Right. One of the challenges that came in this process, and this was a, an intricacy that, that Joel is kind of stuck with, which is multiple districts said that they would share the information, but district name was not something that they wanted shared. Um, and basically that from a public perspective, if people wanted to walk through their benefit and cost packages, they invited, they would generally just invite people to go to the website, walk their way through it, and then meet with HR if they wanted to talk about benefits and packages, or thus making it a little bit more challenging. Um, do you have anything to add, or is that? <laughs> no, I don't. There were many school districts that did want to remain anonymous and not have that information shared publicly, just to maintain their competitiveness in the market as well. This is going to, this is, I mean, what we're hearing is that this is going to be a difficult nut to crack by the numbers. And that at some level there's, there's going to be a non-quantitative judgment. Right. Yeah. Hence, hence why for the main part I landed on a number that ended up as a salary total package 1% lower than the teachers. Um, because for me that was one of, one of the overall guiding principles that I ended up landing on. Um, similarly, I don't think that at 2.5% we gain ground on anyone significantly, and I don't think we would lose ground. So as we look from a competitive perspective, it puts us sort of probably in that mid-pack um, from colleague superintendents sort of informally. Um, I know a superintendent who settled at 0, zero within their district, and I know one who settled at 4 and 4. Um, and so somewhere in the middle, depending on, on those ranges, are happening sort of across the metro as we speak. Um, the other thing that is very difficult is, is that people respond based on market timing. And so one example would be as we changed our sub-salary last year, other districts, for example, in Minneapolis Public School, they added, if you sub two days in one of their high-need schools, they give you a third day free for pay. Um, and so there are districts doing creative, innovative things to make themselves financially more competitive. Um, and we end up in some ways trying to maintain our spot, but also get ahead of the game as much as, much as we can. Yeah, I, I, I would personally feel better if we, if we could see a, see a survey and see how many districts, you know, whether we identify with them or not. Mm -hmm. um, it, it would be helpful for me to get my head around it. I'm not, I'm not objecting to the number or, or, the, or the, you know, the, the thought process that went into arriving at, at, at the proposed numbers or anything like that. It's just the dynamic is, is, is just that, you know, we're being provided information within this negotiation by the people with whom we're negotiating. And so I would like the information to sort of be overwhelming and obvious, right? Mm -hmm. unless, unless I'm going to go through the process of individually, you know, me personally going through and mining data and websites and, and pulling this information. If that's what it is, then, then I'll do that. But, you know, if, if we're going to go about it and have, have the information pro provided by the administration, I would like for it to be extensive enough to, to make it the, the the no doubt decision, um, for me at least. I can pull up that spreadsheet. I just like a couple seconds. I can remove the names of the school districts and show you the spreadsheet if that's something you would like to see here, or we can certainly provide that to you in written copy. I, I, I would like, yeah, I, I would need more time than, than, sure. than to stare at it yeah. from here. Absolutely. So, so one, one item of uh, not 100% certainty would be, you know, regarding the uh, market analysis. Uh, are there other items that board members uh, would like to bring up relative to this, to the uh, management team handbook? Did you find other districts or directors of finance and HR are on the same level as curriculum specialists? There are many districts where they are on the same level and there's also many districts where they're not. It really depends on the structure that they have set up. Many districts will run with an executive director of human resources that's more on the assistant superintendent level or an executive director of finance. Others will run where there's an assistant superintendent in those roles and then director levels underneath that that then correlate with the other directors of curriculum and instruction, teaching and learning, uh, and communications, different departments like that. Other questions for Mr. Janowski or Mr. Miltier? Uh, we would have a couple of options at this point. We would certainly have an option if the board member, uh, if there are no further questions, I'm sorry, I should have paused for a moment there. 
make space for the questions. Okay. Um, so we would have a couple of options uh, if there is a board member who is uh, wanting to make a motion on the handbook as presented, we certainly could entertain that motion. Uh, if there is uh, interest in gathering, uh, you know, having a second look at this, we could entertain uh, the option of taking a second look um, uh, with, with the data as presented. So I think those would be a couple of options that would be on the table for board members. I, I, I would like a little more information if that's all right. So it, would I move to table the item then? That would be, that would be the technical so, Roberts rule. Then, I, then I will move to table the item. Second. So we have a motion for Mr. Paulus to table the item and bring back at our December 21st meeting. Yep, seconded. And that is seconded by Ms. Etchen? All right, so we do have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor of the motion to table and bring back at our 1221 meeting, please say aye. 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 And any opposed? Please say no. Uh, the chair will vote aye. We will bring this back at our 1221 meeting and then we will just ask for the market analysis data to be presented at the 1221 meeting and we'll look forward to, uh, we'll look forward to a success discussion at that point. Sounds good. For clarification purposes, is there any additional information you'd like to have at that time um, prior to a vote or prior to moving this forward? So it sounds like the, mar yeah, the market analysis, it sounds like that's the piece that will we'll seek additional clarity knowing that um, this is going to be a hard one to get completely quantitative clarity on, um, but uh, with some qualitative analysis we'll be uh, looking at that. Uh, very good. Um, so the classified management team handbook is a related item, which we can, Mr. Miltier or Mr. Nelson, so can I'm bring forward. Yes. And we'll have a similar conversation prior to retracting till the 21st. So as we look at the classified management team, we followed a similar process. Um, Within their goals, um, one of the main priorities of that group was to increase incentive pay. Um, separate from the management team group, which has a 6% clause in their contract, the classified management have a 2% um, clause within their contract. Um, and so in retaining that concept of approximately 1% below where the teacher final settlement was, um, it's recommended that a base salary increase of 2% to the classified management team um, with a couple of title changes, changing Supervisor of Nutrition Services to Director, um, Supervisor of Building Grounds and Transportation to Director of Facilities and Transportation. Um, and then, as we recall some of the things we did within our IT department, changing title Network Administrator to Tech Systems Administrator and Computer ter Repair Technician also becomes Technology Support Specialist um, in working to realign some of those positions. Um, similarly, we eliminated the supervisor of technology position as Mr. Patternus is overseeing that group and that employee was reassigned to the technology systems administrator position. Um, as we work to do that alignment um, towards that 25 day vacation, um, looking at a reduction of vacation days for the director of nutrition services from 28 to 25 and a slow increase of the number of vacation days for all other classified management from eight days to 20, which is the large group of classified management who aren't in directorial positions. I mean, I'm looking back up to that 2% salary increase, um, a 1% additional increase in the incentive pay going from two to, two to 3%. Uh, based on past practice, employees end up at about 0.8% of their incentive pay. So that would end up functionally to about a 2.8%, which is similar to the steps and lanes that are coming, or the, the additional growth that would, was recommended within the management team handbook. Um, similarly, in year two, um, base salary of 2%, that change of president's day that we had discussed before, um, and then looking at that incentive pay now going from 3% to 4%, the ultimate goal in trying to work to align to one set of incentive pay across the organization, but, but staggering that in over a period of time. So that also is that, that same percentage raise over the second year. So questions for 
Mr. Janowski or Mr. Miltier around the management, or I'm sorry, the classified management team handbook. And it's just one quick reminder prior to the questions. We did a similar salary study. Uh, Mr. Miltier is able to share spreadsheets, data, and information in regard to those salaries, as I'm assuming we're looking and wanting to compare market analysis for that group also. I would find that helpful. Mr. Chair, I would move that we table this agreement until the next meeting. I'll second. Very good. Is there any discussion? Uh, there's a motion from Paulus and a second by Malik that we table the classified management team handbook until our 1221 meeting. Is there any discussion on this motion? So knowing that the uh, piece of data that we're, we'll be looking at for, we'll, for both will be the market analysis, and that's the... Uh, That'll be the particular piece of information. Um, and I guess, Joel, if you've got some of that prepared, uh, maybe we could, you know, normally our, our practice is to, uh, you know, send out, send out the information with the board packet, you know, the weekend before, but perhaps we could go ahead and just get that information sent out sooner rather than later, and that would give members an opportunity to review it. And if there were specific questions or needs, then that would give you some time to do some other legwork if need be. Absolutely. Very good. So a motion and a second to table this item to the next meeting. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Chair votes aye. We will take this up at our 1221 meeting. Very good. Uh, we can move on to item three, which is donations. Okay, so we have three donations to acknowledge today. Uh, one from Language and Friendships. Richfield High School German Club received $50 to support the great activities they do throughout the year. So Language and Friendships. Um, a donation by Patrick Stone. Richfield STEM School received a donation to support academic and educational programs in the amount of $100 from the Wells Fargo Matching Program. Thank you, Patrick Stone. And then Bryce Eichler-Smith. Uh, doing my best. I am hoping I did Bryce's name correctly. Uh, Richfield High School received a donation to support academic and educational programs in the amount of $500. So thank you, Rich Eichler-Smith. Nice. Bryce. 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 Ah. <laughs> Everybody makes mistakes. Thank you, David. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, David Munoz. <laughs> yes. Very good. We can look for a motion on the donations to accept with gratitude. So moved. So, second. So a motion by Malik and second by Ashmi that we accept the donations with gratitude. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Chair votes aye. The motion carries. So thank you very much to our donors. Uh, we can move on to item seven, advanced planning. First, the legislative update. Um, so just a brief legislative update. Obviously, um, within the federal government, the ESEA National Education Act was in process and I believe renewed. And so we haven't gotten all of the details in regard to what that exactly looks like, um, but our understanding is there will be a significant change to the No Child Left Behind Act, which will begin to slowly change some of the oversight from the federal government and move that on to more local and state level controls. And so we'll look to try to interpret the specifics over the next coming months and be able to bring that back to the board. Yeah, so yes, uh, that was indeed the message from AMSD that it'll be, it's really that shift towards a state level accountability, um, which will, I think, uh, be an interesting thing for us to follow as there's more clarity. Uh, information and questions from the board. Uh, board members have any items to share? I can share um, as a part of a similar piece to what Steve is talking about with the uh, federal legislation, but the other piece that uh, was a big part of our uh, AMSD meeting this past Friday um, was related to the universal pre-K initiative that did not move forward with our last legislative session. Um, however, there's certainly interest on the part of the governor and, and perhaps other uh, uh, legislative uh, members um, to look at that again. Um, we actually had a, a very interesting listening session with uh, a member of, I think she was from MDE, do you remember? Uh, yes, she was one of the early childhood yes, leads from MDE. Yes, early childhood lead from MDE, had a, had a really, really good listening session with this individual, uh, soliciting broad feedback from AMSD member districts. Um, 
And I think the piece that I was most intrigued by is, uh, you know, it's evident that, uh, you know, if, if we do move forward with, you know, as we move forward, I think it's probably more as we move forward and what sort of manifestation, uh, you know, the pre-K reform takes as a, rather than if, because I think that there's probably pretty broad support to do something. Um, but it's pretty clear that it's also, we're also talking about a mixed model. Um, which is, would not be solely administered by the school district, but that the school district may be sort of the hub for uh, organizing and aligning um, uh, pre-K instruction that is perhaps delivered through multiple providers of that instruction, whether it be district-based programs, private programs, et cetera. Um, and so I'm very intrigued to see how that moves forward, and I think it may present a real opportunity for us here in Richfield, or perhaps to partner broad, more broadly with uh, our neighboring communities around how we can most effectively partner with sort of that broad range of um, uh, providers of early uh, early instruction. Any other information and items to share? I have a question. We we had talked a meeting or three ago about um, liaison assignments and I was just curious if we were going to follow up on that or if Todd and Deb would prefer we take that up in January. <laughs> um, actually, so I've been in contact with new board members Cole and Bracky um, and they have s sort of recommended basically f we counted up the number of opportunities for people to participate as liaisons. It was found that um, Mr. Nolenberger and Ms. Etchen had quite a few, um, and they have been representing our board very well. Um, so looking over that number overall, each of the two new board members selected four, um, and we just got those confirmed. So I'm going to be sending back to the board because there's some additional open opportunities for some of our current board members and their representation. I'm suggesting that landing somewhere around four um, would actually provide an equitable opportunity for our board members to sort of carry an equal load or share in the joy of representation of Richfield <laughs> Public Schools. Um, and so I will be in my board letter on Friday sending back basically with uh, Ms. Bracke and Ms. Cole's names in and sort of leaving some of those other areas blank um, for those who are wanting to step in. And then we will re-provide the opportunity should Ms. Bracke and Ms. Cole want to take additional ones on also. And I, I do know that Todd had mentioned that WEMEP was perhaps a particularly sensitive area. Did, and yeah. we, we had sort of let it, left it as, as soon as possible. Is that? Yes, Ms. Bracke has agreed to be partnering Crystal in that transition. Crystal will be stepping forward. Absolutely. Outstanding. Yes, she Thank will. you. Thank well, you, Crystal. Way to go, yeah. Crystal. Very good. So our next meeting uh, will be the 21st of December uh, here, here in the district boardroom at 7 o'clock p.m. Uh, at that meeting, we will certainly be looking forward to the opportunity to thank Mr. Nolenberger and Ms. Etchen for their years of service. We will then have our first meeting in January on the 4th. Uh, that will be here in the district in the boardroom as well. That will be our organizational meeting, at which point in time we will select officers for the 2016 year. Are there any other agenda items that board members would like us to be considering? So one reminder, just a couple of things bringing back since we are not uh just as a reminder that I have in my notes from you all, um, an update coming out of RDLS because we did have that significant staff transition, so we wanted to have that update. And then also a VIVA dollar update. If you recall, this, this group had a, we had a change of practice of our health funding of, of VIVA accounts. And so just sort of talking about an update in regard to how that has gone. Good. We can look forward to those updates. If there is no, no further items, then we can look at a motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. Yeah, all right. Motion by Ashmead, second by Paulus that we adjourn. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Your votes aye. We are adjourned. <laughs>